It's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, it's Ronsley. If this is your first volume, welcome. This is a weekly series where I go inside the mind of an entrepreneur, artist, athlete, academic to decipher what is the psychology of our decisions. While I script this volume, it is the 17th of February 2020 and this volume will go live in 11 days. Today, I also announced that for the first time in five years, our podcast conference, We Are Podcast, will have a female headliner. I am so excited about that because I've been trying to achieve that for the last three years, for sure. See, We Are Podcast is the first podcasting conference in the Southern Hemisphere. We started it back in 2015. It is specifically for business owner podcasters and brands that have podcasts. And we've had amazing speakers like John Lee Dumas, Darren Rouse, Jordan Harbinger, Pat Flynn, and Nathan Chan headline our previous years. So I'm excited to say that this year, We Are Podcast will be headlined by this amazing soul. My name is Melissa Ambrosini, and I'm a best-selling author. I've got two books that are out at the moment, Mastering Your Mean Girl and Open Wide. Um, I'm a podcaster and speaker. And everything I do is with the intention to empower people to unlock their full potential and live their best life. Today, we go inside the mind of a best-selling author, podcaster, keynote speaker, teacher. But more importantly, a wife, friend, dancer, and actor with her own IMTB page. I was lucky to have this interview experience because I drove a couple of hours from our studios in Brisbane to the National Park in Noosa to be welcomed into her home for lunch that her husband, Nick, cooked for us. That was special indeed. So to help you with context, I wanted to start with Melissa's motto in life. When I interviewed David Wolf on my podcast, who's a beautiful human being, he said to me, today is the best day ever. And he says it like that. And he says, write it on your mirror. And he said, treat every day like the best day ever. And I literally, that is my motto. I'm like, and I asked myself, what can I do to make this the best day ever? Like, what can I do? And sometimes it's like, for me today, I want to go for a swim. Or it's like, I want to catch up with a girlfriend. Like that's, I really, or I want to have a good conversation with my husband or I want to make a picnic and go and have lunch with him or something like that. But every day, wake up and ask yourself, what will bring me the most joy and what will make today the best day ever? What will make today the best day ever? Sometimes this question is a bit much. Our minds make up all sorts of reasons why that isn't a relevant question to ask because I actually have to worry about a whole bunch of things, including the bills, the people that rely on me, the career I've worked hard to build, the life I currently have, the list is endless. But stopping to ask this question every day would help, I suppose, because that would mean that after a while, the mind would run out of excuses, I suppose. Because here's the kicker, we all know what would make our lives amazing. And we unconsciously engineer scenarios to make sure we feel enough pain to make that change that our soul really desires. Because to every high point, there is a backstory. 2010 was when I had my awakening, so to speak. Before that, I was actually a professional dancer. I danced at the Moulin Rouge in Paris. Um, I did acting and TV presenting and a little bit of modeling. And that's what I'd done. You know, I started dancing when I was three years old. So all I knew was performing. All I knew was dancing and acting and all of that, all of that stuff. And then uh, after living in London for two years in Paris for a year, I moved home and I didn't want to come home. My visa expired. I had to be back here. 
um, because there was no other, no other option. My friends dumped me. The guy I was seeing dumped me. I had to move home. So I had to leave my thriving career in the UK. My health was plummeting. I was in and out of emergency. I had no money. I was sleeping on my friend's single fold out hospital bed in her lounge room. And I just was like, what has my life (laughs) come to? Like, is this really it? Is this really it? So I did what a lot of people do and I drowned it in partying. So I spent a year partying and being in and out of emergency and the hospital because my body was just telling me to stop and slow down and what you're doing is not good for you, Melissa. And I ignored it and I ignored it and I ignored it. Um, The universe kept on trying to give me these little warning signs. And then the universe literally pulled the rug from underneath me. And I ended up in hospital for a week, just over a week. And I had a whole host of health issues. Like basically my entire immune system shut down. So I had so many physical health issues. I had um, like chronic fatigue, adrenal fatigue. I got the worst case of the cold sore virus that the doctors had ever seen. I had them all over my face, like in my mouth and down my throat. Couldn't eat, drink, couldn't even talk. Like my mouth was closed shut because there was sores all over my face. Like and if I went to open my mouth, I'd crack all the sores and they would bleed. Like it was so painful. So I was dealing with all this physical stuff. And then on top of that, dealing with the emotional side of things. So I was dealing with depression, anxiety, and panic attacks. Everyone else's wake up call just seems like great stories until we decide to really look at the wake up calls we've already had in life. The ones that repeat themselves ever so subtly. Effects of psychological trauma is always physically experienced as Dr. Pat Ogden, PhD founder and director of the Sensory Motor Psychotherapy Institute recalls. I, I worked with one woman that I'm thinking about. I, I mean, I never would have come up with this for her. Um, she uh, uh, tended to get very hyper aroused. And as we started exploring that in her body, I was tracking for if there were ways that her body would automatically try to calm her. Because if you see that in the body, then you can capitalize on it and it can have meaning for the person. Okay. And um, her hands kept coming together like this. And, and, and so I asked her about that. And it was so touching because as she felt her hands and experienced that, she was reminded of her mother who had passed away a, a, a terrible death from alcoholism alone in a, a slum, you know, and uh, her, but her hands took her to a very positive experience of her mother. She loved her mother's hands. Her mother had very beautiful hands and she remembered her mother's hands holding hers. So this became a gesture that she could do consciously to calm her down and implicitly trigger those positive attachment memories of her mother. In a study conducted by the Trauma Centre at Justice Resource Institute, 64 women diagnosed with suffering from PTSD were assessed on how yoga affected their mental health. After 10 weeks, the women who practiced yoga once weekly had fewer symptoms of PTSD. In fact, 52% of participants no longer met the criteria for PTSD at all. Here is Russell Brand, the famous comedian, talking about yoga. Yoga, it reduces cortisol, the stress hormone. Yoga, 64 women who were suffering from PTSD had their symptoms reduced by the practice of yoga significantly over a one-month period. Is yoga a necessary salve to the problems of contemporary living? Is yoga a physical way of incorporating spirituality into your daily life? Is yoga much more than a fitness fad, much more than aerobics with incense? I would say it is because I've been practicing yoga for a long time. 
And what I sometimes need is a physical component to my spiritual practices, sitting around meditating. I do that every day and it's wonderful and it's necessary. But as a supplement to it, the practice of moving the body in alignment with the breath, learning to move free from constant thought. These are powerful ideas. Of course, there's the obvious physical benefits in terms of the your body feeling stronger and more flexible and evidently hormonal benefits, this reduction of cortisol. And I was in hospital feeling the most unwell I've ever felt but the most alone I have ever felt in my entire life. Like, and I literally was like, is this it? Is this what we are here for, to suffer? And at this time I was 24 years old, um, 23, 24, can't remember, one of those ages. And a few weeks before this that I ended up in hospital, I just started this thing called yoga And I was like, what is this yoga business? It feels so good. So I just started it. So I'd met these new friends at yoga and they sent me a care package to the hospital. And in that care package was like crystals and um, angel cards and teas and herbal tinctures and a book that changed my life. That book was Louise Hayes, You Can Heal Your Life. And I remember reading this book and I would turn to my mom and I said to her, why didn't you tell me that we create our own life? Why didn't you tell me that we are creating our own reality moment by moment? She would just look at me and she's like, Melissa, you know, I was doing the best that I could. And and absolutely, everyone is always doing the best that they can. And I did go through a blame stage toward my parents. And, you know, I have moved through that and I'm so grateful and I just love and adore them now. And that was the awakening for me. I read this book and I literally, like that, decided to change my entire life. There was this voice inside me that said, if you get healthy and happy again, You'll live a life beyond your wildest dreams. And I didn't know what that voice was. I now know it's your intuition, but like I didn't know what intuition was back then. There's not a stitch of active wear in these yoga classes. It's all about hard hats, high vis and steel toe boots and helping tradies transform their physical and mental health. Meditation has completely changed my life. Tools down. Bums up. Yeah, a little bit uncoordinated, but we'll get there. <laughs> I would have wedge you, but that's all right. <laughs> Anywhere you can find a space to sit, it could be in the smoko shed, could be in the car, wherever you, wherever you are. Yoga, Pilates and meditation help mental and physical health, two areas that many tradies struggle with, according to research. That was a current affair report done a year ago. I remember Philip McKernan in volume one talk about the biggest tragedy in today's world. It's the fact that we are becoming so disconnected and we're forgetting how to feel and society doesn't reward us with emotion. It rewards us based on intellect and what is perceived as to be successful. And a lot of us are focusing and obsessing about living in the now. I don't want to fucking live in the now if my now is shit. I have no interest in living in the now if my now is shit. All the rest of us are forward focused. My work and what I believe is if you want to understand who you are at the core, intellectually and emotionally, there's only one place to go and that is into your past. That is the place that holds every key to who you are and who you're going to be, whether you like it or not. If we don't accept who we are, the transitions we make to become someone else don't come from the most genuine of places. But that isn't done consciously. You, you are unique. There is only one you. No one can do you better than you. They can try. Like I can try to be you. I could dress like you, you know, but it just wouldn't work. No one is you. And the world needs you. The world needs you and your uniqueness and your quirks and your gifts whatever that is. And when we don't 
share that, like when we aren't our authentic self and we aren't sharing our true self, we're doing a disservice to the people around us and to the world. So I feel like it's our duty to be our true self and to just share that without the comparison piece of looking at everybody else and to just share that with whoever it is, whether it's our partner, our kids, or 100,000 people on Instagram. We, we do need to share who we truly are. There's nothing else that we need to do. We don't need to try and emulate anyone or be anyone. And I think when I realized that, when I realized that there was no other Melissa Ambrosinis in the world, there is no one doing exactly what I'm doing with my voice because they're not me. They, they don't, ha- they're not in my body and we're all so beautiful and we're all so unique and we all have a message to share. So we've got to stay in our own lane. Coming up after the break, how to tame the voice and one of my alter egos, Redonkulous Ronsley. There is schools of thoughts that that are like, you've got to kill the ego. And then the last step in the cast process, T stands for truth. Yeah, I, I think I'm proud of, sure, the big things, the books, and but more I'm proud that I had the courage to move through the limiting stuff. The main objective of this audio project is to bring together entrepreneurs and creatives who share similar values so that they can find the courage to put out their authentic voice for the right people to hear, which allows for them to make their impact on the world. Every great movement started with a memorable speech. For access to full-length interviews, go to psychologyofentrepreneurship.com and click the button. Before the break, your uniqueness, Melissa's awakening and making today the best day ever. Now, the meat and potatoes, or if you're Indian, the curry and rice section of the program. (laughs) (laughs) Melissa has an amazing TED talk. Yes, this was done at TEDx Monash University, but it has been uploaded to the TED website and is now not a TEDx talk anymore, but a TED talk. The topic, how your inner critic is holding you back. And that voice, well. Well, I personally think that there's only one voice and you can call it your ego or your inner critic or your inner mean girl or your inner bad boy or negative Nancy, whatever voice you want to give it, right? And I think it's really important to give it a voice, which is what I talk about in my TED Talk. I take them through the cast process and the first step of the cast process is C, creating a character. C stands for character. So you've got to give that voice a little character and you can call it Bob, Mary, whatever you want. And I personally believe that there's this one voice, this one negative inner critic voice, but that voice has different disguises. So that voice might sound different and wear different clothes and, you know, show up in different ways, but it's still the same negative voice, right? And I think that is a lot less confusing for people because if they think there's multiple voices, they get overwhelmed. They're like, yeah, but this voice is saying this and then this voice is saying this and it's just one negative limiting fear-based voice, your ego, that's it. And so that's the first step is in the cast process is you've got to create this character. There is schools of thoughts that that are like, you've got to kill the ego. And then there's some that are like, you've got to make friends with it. So I personally believe we don't need to kill the ego. The ego is a part of us. And that voice is there 
to it thinks it's helping you. It truly does think it's helping you, but it's not. And your job is to be discerning between its characters, like the characters that it plays, you know, because that voice is also the voice that says, do not get in that car with that guy. Do not do that. This is a bad idea, Melissa, you know, or do not walk down that alley. That is also the same voice, you know, like that voice can also be super helpful. Um, And so I feel like we really do have to create this character. I, I named my character Redonculus Ronsley <laughs> because I like the way the word sounds. It is a synonym for ridiculous. And it's hard to use Redonculus in everyday sentences without sounding like a total jackass. Melissa, I'm playing along. What is the second step? The second step in the cast process is awareness. You've got to become aware of it. And the way that you do that is you say, you know, my inner mean girl or my inner critic is telling me that I can't launch this business or I'm not good enough to write a book or who do you think you are starting a podcast? No one's going to listen besides your mom, maybe. You know, that's that inner critic voice. That It's so important to be aware of it. Because she or he, whatever, I'll just speak from my experience, she is the one that, that will say those things. Who do you think you are starting a podcast? And also, okay, standing in the wings, about to walk onto my TED Talk, she was like, you're going to fall over. Everyone's going to laugh at you. You are not qualified enough. Who do you think you are? Like she literally was saying those things. I could have, I had two choices in that moment. I could have listened to her, agreed, run in the other direction crying, or I could have practiced what I was about to just teach everybody, which is taking them through that cast process and do it then and there in the wings before I walked on stage, which is exactly what I did. And so we need to become aware of that voice. I find a lot of people say to me, it's really helpful to write it down. So if you do have that voice going in your head right now, writing down, my inner critic is currently telling me that I can never start a podcast or my inner critic is telling me that I'll never heal or my inner critic is telling me I'll never get out of debt or I'll never meet the guy, whatever it is. So writing it down, that is the second step. For you listening, what is your inner critic telling you you can't do. The third step is S, C A S, and that stands for shut. So what that means is we need to shut the door on our inner critic. So your inner critic is going to come knocking on your mental door to plant these seeds of doubt, these negative fear seeds of doubt. And instead of letting her in to have lunch and stay over and sleep over and wear your clothes and hang out, You say, thank you, but no, thank you. I'm not interested today. Like I'm too busy, like living my dream life and helping people. I don't have time to entertain you. So thank you, but no, thank you. Like think of it like an annoying salesperson that's trying to sell you like something that you're just not interested in. Okay. You say, thank you, but no, thank you. Melissa, and the last step. And then the last step in the cast process, T stands for truth. You have to come back to the truth. You have to remember that she is not the truth. She is not telling you the truth. Her job, your inner critic's job, is to keep you stuck and small in your comfort zone. That is not why we are here. We are here to share our unique gifts with the world, to be the best version of ourselves, whatever that looks like. For some people, it's multiple seven figure businesses. You know, for some people, it's being the best mom. And it doesn't matter what it looks like, but you just need to come back to the truth of you, the truth of who you are, because what your inner critic tells you is not the truth. What is your comfort zone? What annoys you? What things do you avoid? Psychologist Rick Hansen's advice on dealing with your inner critic is to try regarding it as something that lacks credibility. Imagine it as a ridiculous character, like a silly cartoon villain. 
That cast process is pretty impressive, and I suggest you taking 14 minutes out of your day to watch her TED Talk. It will be linked in the show notes. While you contemplate whether this is a method that you would try and implement, I wanted to make sure you have your definition of success. Because no amount of success is worth it if it doesn't match what you really believe success to be. I feel like we definitely have to take inspired action. If you, if you have a goal, you've got to take daily inspired action. That doesn't mean you flog yourself and you burn yourself out and you just push yourself at the detriment of your own health and happiness. Because then when you get there, you can't even celebrate because you're, you're in hospital with adrenal fatigue like I was, you know? So it's like, what is the point if you're going to burn yourself out in the process? Your highest role here on earth is to take responsibility for your energy to make sure that you are in alignment, to make sure that you are in joy because you then become, and this might be woo-woo, but you become a magnet for more things that are also vibrating at that high frequency. But if you are vibrating at a low frequency, then you are going to attract that into your life. And if you are vibrating at a high frequency, you are going to attract more of that into your life. Reflecting back though on my entrepreneurial journey is I did take a lot of action. I did show up. I did go for it. And it has got me to where I am today. So I'm so grateful. But it did burn me out a bit too. So it's like, what's more, what's the most important thing to you? Like for me now, the most important thing for me, like success to me and each day, it's like, did I do work that made a difference? Did I have a good time doing it? You know, did I connect with people that I love? Did I serve? Did I show up as the best version of me? Like these are really important for me now. Um, As opposed to back when I first started, like it was just flog it until, you know, I would work all day and night. Working all day and night is what was told to us, I suppose. Work hard and you'll get all the success you desire. But that doesn't work when you are in a relationship, when there are other people around you that want the real you to show up, as Melissa explained. Like when we first met, like we were working at nighttime. Now we're like, we have some strict boundaries around that, especially because we both work from home and we have we had to put in some boundaries around that otherwise we would just work 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 until midnight and then wonder why our relationship was heading south <laughs> so yeah i think as well it all comes back to what is meaningful to you what's your definition of success because we all have different definitions of success and what is success to you So when you put your head on your pillow at nighttime, for you to say, today was a really good day. Today was a really successful day. What has to happen? And I got really clear on that. And I wrote down exactly what success means to me. And I truly do now live a life that's beyond my wildest dreams. Like every day I am so grateful I get to do work that I love, surrounded by beautiful people. I live in paradise. I'm healthy. I'm married to my soulmate. I have beautiful friends. I have created all of this. I wasn't born like with all of this. Like I created it and it, you know, it took work and lots of therapy and thousands and thousands of dollars on coaches and counselors and support to get to where I am today. But it's all worth it. It's all worth it. What have you created? Look at your life, your relationships, your business, your success. And while I let you contemplate that, Melissa has a second book. Well, my second book, Open Wide, Uh, The subtitle is A Radically Real Guide to Deep Love, Rocking Relationships, and Soulful Sex. And in that book, I talk a lot about the masculine and the feminine energy. 
And I personally believe we all have masculine and we all have feminine. And it's our duty to make sure that our masculine and our feminine is balanced within ourselves. Because if you're out of balance, like if I'm too masculine, I'm going to butt heads with my husband. And if I'm too feminine, we're also going to butt heads. And so it's my responsibility to notice when I'm out of balance. And I do have a tendency to go more toward the masculine because for a lot of my day, and this is not so much anymore because I've been able to over the past year living here, rewiring, reconnecting with mother nature, I've stepped a lot more into my feminine energy. But the doing, the achieving, the creating, the go-getting, that is more of that masculine yang energy. And it's great. We all need it. We need it. Um, but I notice, yeah, if I stay too long in that, I will butt heads with my husband. So it's my responsibility to, when I finish my work day, is to do whatever I need to do to kind of get back more into my feminine energy. And there's little things and little tips and tricks. I talk about this in Open Wide that I do. Even something as simple as having a shower or connecting with mother nature or meditating or getting out of what I was wearing that day whilst I'm working and then just putting a different outfit on, even like putting on an essential oil, like these little things that you can do for the women listening that can really help you step back more into your feminine energy and to balance that within yourself because the body wants homeostasis. The body wants a lovely, nice balance between your masculine and your feminine. And the more in tune you become within yourself, you can see when you're out of balance. I know when I've been too in my yang, when I've been too in my masculine, I know what that feels like in my body. And I know what I need to do to come back and rebalance it. Um, And for me, one of the best is getting out into nature. It's one of the best ways to reground yourself and to reconnect yourself and to center yourself. For me, this part coming up is the best bit of all. This bit changed me. The question I asked Melissa was, with the list of accomplishments she has, what was she truly proud of? I feel truly proud that I've been able to move through what I've been able to move through. I've been, I feel truly proud that I have reprogrammed so much because I wouldn't have what I have if I didn't. And so I feel proud of myself for continuously doing the work and showing up to my meditation twice a day, every day, getting support from counselors, coaches, therapists, psychotherapists, you know, all the people that have supported me over the past 10 years. I'm, I'm so grateful for them. But yeah, I, I think I'm proud of, sure, the big things, the books, and, but more I'm proud that I had the courage to move through the limiting stuff that I moved through because it's huge and we've all got our stuff and for me it was just ginormous and there was times where I thought don't know if I'm going to be able to move through this I just don't think it's possible and you do you do you get through it and you're like wow I'm so proud of myself because the alternative is to stay in suffering and stay in darkness or depression. And I've been there and it's not fun. It's not fun. And we got a long time here. <laughs> we got a long time here on earth. And so we may as well make the most of it. You know, like I said before, we don't know how long we're going to live here for. So we may as well have the best freaking time ever. Don't save the dress for the best occasion. Don't save up for the holiday. Don't don't wait. Don't hold back. Don't save the best cutlery. Like don't just do it now. 
Whatever it is that you want to do in your life, do it now. Treat every day like Christmas. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Coming up on the psychology of entrepreneurship. I'm George Shepard. I am a, a performer, a singer, a musician, songwriter. I'm always that guy who who just says yes. Like I, whether whether it's to my detriment or not, I I'm really bad at telling people no. Everybody else around me knew way more than me because they'd spent their whole lives, you know, getting prepared for it. And I felt, and I still feel like I'm on the back foot with it all. And I'm trying to quickly catch up and learn as much as I can. Psychology of entrepreneurship. I interviewed Melissa because she is the host of the top rated Melissa Ambrosini show podcast with over 10 million listens and counting the best-selling author of Mastering Your Mean Girl and Open Wide. She's been named a self-help guru by Elle magazine, certified life coach, certified holistic health coach, certified yoga teacher. Her book, Mastering Your Mean Girl, has 4.7 out of 5 ratings on Amazon with almost 400 reviews. She is a stepmother, a wife, (laughs) and a friend. This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing and sound design by Tiago Vega. Voiceovers by Kelly Bonniman. Guest research and content by Claire Gould and Corinne Castles. Project managed by Shannon Morrison. Produced and hosted by me, Ron Slivaz. For more episodes and where to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Hey, it's Kaylee from Must Amplify. I'm the sound engineer for this volume of Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I'm part of the team that made this production come alive. I work as a part of a global team with our studios based in West End, Brisbane, Australia. If you would like a podcasting checklist, email me at kaylee at amplifyagency.media. That's K-A-I-L-I at amplifyagency.media. We specialize in finding your voice and making sure it's heard by the right people. If you are considering whether a podcast is a good idea for your business, check out our other show on shouldistartapodcast.com. Cancel your plans for April 30th and May 1st, this 2020, because Australia's first podcasting conference, We Are Podcast, is back for its fifth annual event. Hosted in Brisbane, Australia, this year's event will be focusing on 15 tactics to grow and leverage your podcast, your business, and your voice. You can bet that you'll leave feeling connected, inspired, and tactically armed with ways to make 2020 your best year yet. How would past attendees sum up We Are Podcast? Connection. Bloody brilliant. Informative. Creative. Ah. It's challenging. I'd say impactful, positive. Supportive. Inclusive. Completely inspiring and focusing. Fun, helpful, and yeah, generous. It's a generous event. There's a lot of giving. For more information and to purchase tickets, head over to wearepodcast.com. And that's a wrap.